So Jesus is every one of the fivefold ministries. He is an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And um, that's why he's the chief cornerstone, because every other ministry flows out of Jesus Christ. He must be head and centre. He must be above all. And I, I really sense that in this season that we're, well, I hate that word, no, sorry, Lord, I hate, hate the devil and sin. But I dislike the word season because it seems we're always saying new season, new time. But the Lord is maturing us. And as he matures us, there is coming a greater call on our sanctification, a further separatedness, if you like, from the world and from church culture. And the scriptures for Jesus, which we won't necessarily go into, but just so you can have a look at them in your own time. Jesus, as the apostle, well, he was the sent one. So anytime you see the word sent, it's talking apostolically. But he is our apostle in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. He is our apostle, the high priest of our confession. Apostle, Hebrews 3, 1. He's the prophet in Matthew 21, verse 11, it says, um, <clears throat> the crowds were talking about Jesus, and in verse 11, the crowds replied, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And in Matthew 14, 5, Oh, sorry, that was about John as a prophet, not Jesus. But that's the other one. Every time Jesus prophesied about his, his death to his disciples, that was him functioning as a prophet. He was an evangelist, Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, where he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We need the laborers. We need the evangelists. We need the ones to go out there and to get the people. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. He is the evangelist. Also in John chapter 4, verses 5 to 7 and verse 10, and the next few Sundays are more teaching than anything else. But he is the, um, he's the evangelist. And this, the, John chapter 4 is where he met the woman at the well. And... Um, he talked to her, you know, you've got five husbands and the man you're living with now is not a husband. And she raced back into the city and said, the man that I've just met, you know, he told me everything about myself that he, he couldn't have known. But she became one of the greatest revivalists, the greatest re evangelists in the New Testament. Uh, and and if, you, if you've got a passion translation down at the bottom in the study notes, they will actually give you her name and that she had a, a large team and she just raised up one of the largest evangelic, evangelistic teams in the, new, in the early church. In Matthew 15, 24, he's the shepherd. And in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, in John chapter 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. When you start to worship Jesus in these positions, as you exalt him as the apostle, as you exalt him as the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, as you exalt him in these things, you will find a greater release of revelation and a greater release of empowerment in these things. We need to be exalting Jesus in everything. This is a season to exalt Jesus. In, um, teach, in Teacher, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, so he's recognised as a teacher from the very beginning, and then down in Matthew 7, 29, Jesus was teaching as one who had authority and not as the scribes. He was the, he was the teacher. So all of the fivefold gifts were operational in Jesus our Lord.
He functioned in each and every one of them. He functioned uh, in, with the Holy Spirit without measure. He had the seven spirits of God and flowing through him. And if you have a look in John chapter 19, see, oh, we've got to stop reading the Bible. Let me explain that. I'm not saying don't read the Bible. But we, we need to stop just reading the Bible and we need to stop studying it from an intellectual point of view. When you open the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants you to know. Otherwise, it becomes familiar. Otherwise, it's just a book with words when it's actually the living word of Jesus Christ, the living word. And in um, John chapter 19, verse 23... This is where Jesus had been crucified and the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, one share for each soldier and also the tunic. So there's five pieces, four, four parts and one tunic. And the tunic was seamless, woven um, from the top throughout. And in verse 24, they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots to decide whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But what they're saying here is there are four parts plus the tunic. There's five things there, and one of them had to be seamless. It was seamless. Like they, they, the, the, the coat, the thing that covered everything else, was one piece, seamless, made from the top down. It was heavenly imprint. We ought to start seeing this. Jesus, everywhere he went, everything he did, it was all about um, it was all about revealing the fivefold. It was about revealing the gifts of God. It was about bringing heaven to earth. And so when he's saying here there's four parts plus the tunic, he was talking about fivefold ministry. And he was saying that fivefold ministry has got to be seamless. There can't be any division. We have to come together as one. It has to come from the top down. It's nothing that we can do on earth up. It has to be released through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the fivefold together. The Holy Spirit's the one who says you've got the anointing of this and you've got the call to do that it's the Holy Spirit who releases it and we can't walk around thinking we're doing this and we're doing that from this point on we can no longer think that way it is the Lord is leading me I heard the Lord say we've got to come to a place where we are totally surrendered to the Lord God and even with regards to a venue for open heaven I surrender the need of a venue for open heaven to the faithfulness of God I'm not going to war for it anymore. I surrender the need to God's faithfulness to bring it about. We have got to become a place where we're a people that are supernatural. You know, we live lives that look pretty natural. They look pretty ordinary. I'm not putting anyone down, but honestly, there's not a big difference between us and the world. But we need to have the supernatural. We need to be flowing with miracles and signs and wonders. Things need to be... And I'm not saying there's not a challenge. I'm not saying there's no, you know, kind of... You've got to press in for some things. But what I'm saying is sometimes when you look at our lives from outside and you look at the lives of the people from outside, there's not a big difference. And there should be. Radical difference. When people come into my house, I want to get it to the place where they fall to their faces and the presence of God fills my house to such an extent. You know, come on. I've got people walking in saying, oh, I can really feel the presence of God. Other people walk in like they sense nothing. That must have been when I've had the TV on too long. But I also had one room where we had a CD playing all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it was just worship or it was teaching, but it was pure. And we had a couple of Christians who could not enter the room because of conviction. I can't go into that room. This is what our lives should be like. That when we walk somewhere, people either drag the sick out into, into the street to be healed by our shadow or they fall to their faces completely convicted by the Holy Spirit and call out for Jesus. We have got to be the light that impenetrates the darkness. And so this seamless unity, you know, even in open heaven, we can't afford to have 
cliques. We can't afford to have little groups here and little groups there. We can have apostolic teams, but in the in the house itself, it must be a seamless unity of love and honour for each other, uh, acceptance of each other. We might not always agree. We might not always feel that this person's doing the right thing, but there will always be love. And there will always be, if they're accepted by Jesus, they're accepted by me. We have to have this seamless unity. And that's what Jesus came to show us, that as he operated in the five-fold ministry, there was, you know, he could easily slip from one to the other. And when we have a five-fold ministry team within open heaven, then the apostolic can easily slip into the prophetic, who can slip into the pastor, the evangelist, you know, the teacher. There's that flowing together. And it was the teams, because in the early church, they went out in teams, two by two and different times like that, which made the impact. They were not lone rangers. We were one. There has to come a change. And it's not about coming to church and, and sitting on our blessed assurances. I'm, I'm wanting the prophetic to come up and say, this is what I'm sensing God is doing right now in the heavens in this meeting. This is what I'm sensing the Holy Spirit is saying. The prophetic can come up and say that. I can then come as an apostle and land the thing, manifest it, or the teacher can come up and bring this is the scripture for you to study out because this scripture pertains to what the prophet has said. Or the pastor can come in and say something else. We come together. We need each other because when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, where it talks about the gifts of the ministry, just turn there. 1 Corinthians. And I said this once and I had a fight with a man because I didn't handle it as wisely as I could have and he left the church. But what I said was pastors, the Hebrew, the Greek word for pastors is only mentioned maybe two or three times in the entire New Testament. And he took offence at that because pastors run the church and pastors are everything and pastors are it. And, and there are other times when, you know, bishop or something could be made to sound like shepherd, but I was talking about the Greek word for pastor. And in First, um, first Corinthians 12, 28, <coughs> it says, so God, this is God, not Jesus with the fivefold, this is God. And we've got to recognise that when you become a kingdom citizen, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> when you become a kingdom citizen, um, <coughs> it, you come under a theocracy. It is a God thing. It is not a democracy where we have a say. It is a theocracy. This is God's kingdom and he rules it. So 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, God has appointed some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracle workers, healers, helpers, administrators in different and um, administrators and speakers in different tongues. There is no mention of a pastor. And yet we have and oh, God, oh gosh, this is going out on YouTube. <sighs> Thank you. But we have churches riddled with administration by pastors. Yes. And it's not in the word. We have to change. Yes. Oh, bless you, Link. Win, thank you. So there's this. We, there's a whole lot of things that we accept in church culture that is not right according to the word. Now I'm not saying that pastors aren't important. We need the the, the under shepherds under Jesus to to minister to the to the the newly converted to teach them how to pray to to study the word. I'm not saying they're not important. They're in the fivefold ministry giftings, but but and that was Jesus's gifts to the body of Christ. But in 1 Corinthians 12:28, this is how God lists it. And I'm telling you right now that you need to. I feel like my hand on my hip saying, this is what you need to do. <sighs> Sorry. We have to learn to live in the supernatural because there are some battles in your life that you will never, ever win without a miracle. Talk to Moses. He could not get the people out of Israel. He could not get them free from Pharaoh without miracles from God. And we think, you know, well, we can just pray and just do something else. There are times when you will need miracles. Miracles are the only thing that is going to change some situations. Talk to, talk to Elijah with the, the prophets of Baal. Talk to these people. 
in the Bible, read about them because they needed miracles from God to fulfill what they, he had called them to do. We think we can do it with the anointing of the Holy Ghost and a bit of prayer and we're facing things where we need a miracle. We've got people in our families that are not born again or have backslidden so far away that we're not even sure where they are. We need a miracle in their lives. You are anointed for miracles. Everywhere Jesus went was miracles. It's not just for the evangelist. That is a power ministry because that, that, that sort of shows the, the greatness of God. It is for every believer. We are to be a sign and a wonder to the world. Miracles. And I'm saying that in the times that are coming, there are some things, battles that we will face, that the only way to get the victory is via a miracle. And if we don't know how to position ourselves for a miracle, because there are laws for miracles, if we don't know how to position ourselves for a miracle, then we will stumble. It'll be harder than it should be. So we're talking about the fivefold. Daniel said to one of my sons today, it's all right, she hasn't got, he said, are you okay for the service? I haven't got my notes fully written out. And she said, that's okay, she doesn't follow them anyway, so. <laughs> it's come true, Danielle. True prophetic voice. The reason that five is number is so important is because five is grace. And grace is the equipping, enabling power of God for us to do what he has called us to do. We can't do it in our own strength. We need his strength. And that's what the grace and the favor of God is for. It is the equipping, enabling power to cause us to, to live to a certain level. In Titus chapter 3, it says that grace teaches us to live a disciplined life, a holy life. And it's a specific level of God's anointing. So it's not, you know, you can sin as much as you like because of the grace of God. That's not true. But the grace of God is your equipping power. It is your enabling. It's a release of favor. It's an impartation. And, and to be honest, why, why, why am I saying that? But to be honest, it's either grace or grind. You are either graced to do something or it is a straight out grind. And, that, and, and frustration and everything else. But I just put it down to grace or grind. So if you want to turn to, Gen and this is a season because Issachar understood the times and the seasons. This is a, a, a month for us, this month of Iyar, Ziph. This is a month for us to look at numbers. It's a particular time to take note of the times, seasons. Look at what are the numbers saying. So turn over to Genesis chapter 15. You let me know when you need to go, so we'll make sure we pray for you. <laughs> Genesis chapter 15. Now this is, um, you know, he's gone and rescued Lot, and, and, uh, and then he's talking to the Lord, and he's saying in Genesis chapter 15, Abram's saying, look, God, you've given me no child, and, and a servant's going to be my heir, and so that they're having this, this thing. And then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of, in verse 7, the, the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land as an inheritance. And Abram said, but Lord God, by what will I know that I'll inherit it? And in verse 9, the Lord said to him, bring to me a heifer, three years old, a she-goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Right there you have the fivefold. Because what happened when he brought those sacrifices was that God released him into a generational covenant. In verse 13, God said to Abram, know positively that your descendants will be strangers dwelling as temporary residents in a land that is not theirs and they will be slaves there and they'll be afflicted, but I will bring judgment on that nation. So he's talking here a generational covenant. So that Abram had to bring five pieces. Genesis chapter 15, verse 9, he had to bring a heifer, a she-goat and a ram, all three years old, and he had to bring a turtle dove and a pigeon. The heifer is uh, at, at the age of three, and I could be totally wrong because I'm a city girl, not a farm girl, but from what I have studied out with the commentaries and the things like that, at three years old, a heifer is eligible to breed and seek a mate. And they seek that, you know, they're, they're ready to breed. 
and apostles seek places that are comparable to what they carry. It's like prophets are not welcome in their own hometown. Apostles have to be geographically positioned so that what they carry can be released into that position and, and it can then go on because apostles send out other teams and they continue to take ground, they continue to take beachheads or make beachheads. So it's a strategic thing. There's the, the heifer and not a bull, not a bull, but a heifer. Um, the she-goat and the ram all had to be three years of age and three talks of the Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The she-goat is easy to milk and pastors give the milk of the word. The ram is, is prophetic because they can direct a herd and they, actual, and they spread seed, they actually breed. You can see that in Genesis chapter 30 with Jacob. So the ram is prophetic, the she-goat is the pastor, the heifer is apostolic. The turtle dove is the teacher representing of the of the Holy Spirit but the teacher who brings words of kindness words of truth so that it settles on people but the pigeon is the evangelist because they can go anywhere they fly anywhere they fly in they fly out and they can drop a message wherever they want and so right there you have the the five represented in Abram's sacrifice. And so we understand fivefold ministry will release. And when it's together, when the fivefold is working together, they will release a generational blessing into your families. They will release generational blessings into towns or cities or countries or communities. They will release it, but we've got to work together. It's not just the apostle. It's not just the prophet or just the pastor, teacher or evangelist. We have to come together, seamless unity, seeking only the will, the, the land, the plan, the purpose of God and because you know sometimes when when prophets come in and they give this amazing prophecy three months later I've got people lined up speaking to me because that prophetic word has not come true so have I missed it what am I doing wrong or was the prophetic pro prophetic not right and the same with an evangelist they come in they, they stir everyone up they're amazing in their gifts aren't they Mike amazing in your gifts evangelistically I mean, you're more apostolic. But evangelists are amazing in their gifts and their healings and the miracles and everything else. But they come in, they do what they do, and they go on. And then you've got a whole bunch of people that have come to the Lord that they've got to be discipled and, and all of that. So, but we've got to come together. If the, if the fivefold is not working together, we are shortchanging the body of Christ and not fulfilling the will of God. Blows in, blows up and blows out. Yeah. <laughs> very true. I was trying to be, but I wasn't very good at being discreet. But you know, but so th this is why I'm, I'm wanting to form uh, apostolic groups within Open Heaven Ministries because we want to be looking at releasing things. We want to be looking at changing things. Now, if you want to turn to First Samuel chapter 17, First Samuel. Chapter 17, we're going to look at David because when he went to fight Goliath, he picked up five stones. So whenever you see a number in the Bible and it seems significant in the story, stop and look at it and think about what it means. Three is always the Godhead. Five is grace. Seven is completion. Eight is a new beginning. Um, is there, they're the main ones, I think, aren't they? Twelve is government. So, but in in um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40, David took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistine, drew near Goliath. Five stones. So that right here we have a demarcation, we have a line drawn in the sand, just as what is happening within the church to this day. We've got a demarcation between Saul the king, who should have been dealing with Goliath, and a shepherd's boy who came to check on his brothers and make sure they had enough to eat. And he has stepped up because he knew his covenant. He had an apostolic power. He had an apostolic call. And he, took, and he said, you know what? This isn't right. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God? Please, God, let some people rise up and talk to our government like that. And so you've got Saul as the king who is a leader 
and a king, should have been apostolic but was not. And he was a leader of the flesh because the people wanted a king to be like other nations. They did not want God to be their head. So they chose to be like other nations. They chose to be rebellious from the start of his ministry. And they rejected God and God's theocracy. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, It's Samuel says to Saul, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. That meant that there would never have been a David. Saul was to have a forever ministry, a forever kingdom, but it ended up going to David because of his inability to follow the instructions of the Lord. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people because you've not kept what the Lord commanded you. So don't think just because you've been promoted in an area, you're going to keep the promotion if you're going to be disobedient to the commandment of the Lord. We can be demoted by the Lord just as quickly as we can be promoted depending on our obedience. And, and in saying that, it's not a question of works. It is a question of a loving heart of obedience. We do what God asks us because of love, not because of works, not because of what it's going to get us, but because we are a living sacrifice, sold out to his pleasure, sold out to execute his pleasure, sold out to him to do what he requires. But Saul didn't do that. He was frightened from the very beginning. And he was, you know, when they went to crown him as king, he's hiding in with the, the, um, the luggage. He's hiding from his call. He's hiding from his anointing. He's hiding from it. He wasn't ready to step up and embrace what God had called him to do. And when he did, he made decisions based upon what he saw and not based upon what God told him. And when Samuel said to him, I want you to wait, when I, and when I come, I'm going to do this, he didn't wait because Saul was a little bit late. Samuel, sorry, was a little bit late. And he thought, oh, goodness, Samuel's not coming. I'd better do it. So he stepped out of his call and into the call of the priest. And when we step out of our call into the call of someone or something else, we open ourselves up to hurt. You have got to know the boundaries of what God has called you to. I know the instant I have stepped over the line. I know the instant. So it's real quick, oh, sorry, God, and I step back. But we need to understand that. So we're going to have a look at some of these things. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 3 to 4, it says the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And a champion went out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was almost 10 feet. And then it goes on to talk about his bronze helmet and he wore a coat of mail and the coat weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze and he had bronze shin armour on his legs and a bronze javelin across his shoulders and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and a shield bearer went before him and Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not the Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And so here's this challenge that's going out. And it went for 40 days. The enemy, ever notice that when you, you've got bills that are due, that the voice of the bills that are due never stop letting you know that this has got to be paid and where are you going to get the money from? It's just constantly there. Or if you're in a toxic relationship, that person's name just keeps coming. I've got to get this sorted. I've got to get this sorted. But he was there. Goliath was there testing the metal of the Israelites, and they were found. What were they found? Lacking. Thank you, because I could not think of the word. They were found lacking. And they would go and hide in the caves when Goliath came out. Goliath actually means, I wrote it down somewhere, a first-generation giant. So the, as a first-generation giant, he paves the way for others to follow. 
You're talking about an iniquitous bloodline here in the natural if you're thinking about it. But Goliath means a first generation giant. He's the head. He's the head. And others will follow. So in 1 Samuel 17, in verse 26, David said to the men standing by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That is a holy attitude. Who are you to come against the armies of God? Who are you to come against the church of Christ? Who are you to come against, you know, the, the individual believers? Who are you to come against them? If you are uncircumcised, if you're, out, you're not in circumcision with an almighty God, and you've got this enemy standing against you, who are you? What gives you the right? You've got no power. But you've got to know that you are in covenant with a holy God. In verse 40, David took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook. Five smooth stones. Smooth. They had been in that brook for a long time. The water washing over those stones had knocked all the sharp edges off, had, had almost had been polished by the water. Water speaks of the Holy Ghost. The flowing out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. And that brook would have swelled with rain up and down. And so this water constantly flowing over these stones that had been there for a long time to become smooth, smooth stones, been in the brook a long time. They'd been proven over time. And because they're smooth, when David had picked them up, there's, they're easy to hold. If they were sharp, not easy to hold. But there's an anointing on them when he picked them up. They're anointed by, they're talking about an anointing. The reason why he did not pick stones up from the ground was because the ground is cursed. He's saying he cannot, you cannot deal with things in the natural, you must deal with it in the spiritual. And the spiritual is represented by the water there in that brook flowing over the stones. Never, ever, ever resort to the natural to deal with any kind of a problem because it originated in the spiritual realm first. The minute you go to the natural realm to deal with something, you have stepped onto Satan's turf. You, you deal with it in the spiritual first. And so he's got these five stones, they're anointed, uh, the water, the Holy Spirit, water symbolic of the Holy Spirit flowing over them. And he did not pick them up from the earth because that is the cursed system. So in verse 49, so I'll go back to verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel whom you have defied. It doesn't matter what what weapon is formed against you? It really doesn't matter what is formed against you. Financial insufficiency, unemployment, possible, you know, what, um, whatever, sickness, disease. It doesn't matter what is formed against you. You come against it in the name that is above all names. You, you come from that place of victory at the very beginning. You don't struggle to find your place. You're already there with Christ seated in victory. And we spend a lot of time looking back to see if there's anything in our bloodline that's hindering us and blocking us. You don't have to spend a lot of time. If there is anything, the Holy Spirit will show you. It is more important to know who you are in Christ, that it doesn't matter what's in your bloodline because you have already been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21. That is your present day possession. When you need to deal with generational bloodlines, the Holy Spirit will let you know. Do not go looking for it. It's much better. The more you know who you are in Christ as a... As a Oh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the more you know that you are that new creation, that you're an ambassador for Christ, the more you know who you are in Christ, the less hold the generational iniquities have on you because they're cleansed out of your system by the truth of who you are in Christ. Jesus was crushed for your generational iniquities. It was dealt with at the cross. So yes, sometimes we need to deal with it, you know, the courts of heaven and whatever, sometimes. But it should only be about 5% of your, of your prayer time. The rest of the time, know who you are. Know your covenant. And then David makes a prophetic decree. This day, 
Today, right now, right here, right now, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I'll smite you and cut off your head and I'll give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day <coughs> to the birds of the air that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel as long as everything we do is for the glory of God. Not for ourselves, not for what we get out of it, but for his glory. But look at David. Not only is he going, he says, I'm kind of going to cut off Goliath's head, but the corpses of the army. He already saw everything smashed. Every, every enemy soldier already dead. He's not, he didn't just claim victory over the giant, but over the forces in the natural as well. Verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. That is an awesome declaration. So in verse 49, David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it and it struck the Philistine, sinking into his forehead and he fell on his face on the earth. That was his unprotected place. So let me tell you why it was so important that it hit him in the in the forehead, because Deuteronomy 28 says that we are the head, not the tail, right? We are the head. Why is the head so important? Not because it just thinks, but it is our command center. Everything that we think, everything we say, everything we smell, everything we taste comes out of our head. That's why it's so important. So the head is the command center. The eyes are talking about revelation knowledge. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. The ears hear the word of God. They hear that still, small voice. The nose is able to smell things out. It's talking about discernment. And the mouth releases decrees of faith or fear. It's about taste. It's an appetite. You know, are you hungry for the things of God or hungry for the things of the flesh? So the mouth talks about decrees. It's a taste, an appetite, um, speech, your teeth. You know, who knows that teeth can rip things to pieces? You can gnaw things or you can meditate, which is chew things over and over. And if there is a beard, it is talking about growth, maturity, and leadership. So the head is really important in so many different ways. And David releases this, this stone, this, this anointed weapon of God, and it hits him in the forehead and it fells him and then he cuts off his head. But David picked up five stones because Goliath had four brothers. So remember we said Goliath is the first generation giant? That means there are others. So once you take one out, remember that there might be, you might have to face the same thing again in a different way. So in 2 Samuel chapter 21, is this helping? Is this any good? Do you want me to pack up and go home? Yeah. 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 to 22. The Philistines had war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David became faint, like he'd, he'd gotten a bit older by here. Verse 16, Ishbi Benno, who was one of the sons of the giants, second generation giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze, was girded with a new sword and thought to kill David. But Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's aid and smote and killed the Philistine. Then David's men charged David, you will no more go out with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. He was getting a bit weak in his older age, so the younger ones wanted to fight. So Ish, Ishbi Beno, Benolo, a name only a mother could love, actually means the giant that sets up. It's a high seat the giant who sets up. So you've got the first generation Goliath, the first generation giant who breaks through, and the next generation, um, Ishbi Benolo, is basically on that giant's shoulders and sets up a high seat. So can you see how they work together? 
Am I making that clear? Has everybody lost me? Or have I lost everybody? And Abishai, David's nephew, his name is My Father is a Gift. So it's always good to look at the names in the Bible because every name is talking about a name, a title, a character. In verse 18, you've got the next giant. After this, there was again, again war with the Philistines. So this is a repeated cycle. Sometimes there is a repetition of warfare cycle in order to uproot all the giants that come from the one family. Verse 18, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and then Sibachai the Hushathite slew Saph, who was a descendant of the giant. So Saph means guarding the threshing floor. Saph's job as a spiritual, as a giant, guarding the, the threshing floor, meant that he was going to stop revelation knowledge flowing into the Israelites, and he would also stop provision and resources. He was guarding the threshing floor. Nothing was going to get past him and go to the Israelites. And then in verse 19, so you've got rid of the three main ones. The first one, the one that came in after Goliath and set up a high seat, took the high place. And then you've got the third one that came and guarded what they had stolen. And then the fourth one, is in verse 19 where it says there was again is another war at Gob with the Philistines and Elhanan, son of oh, Jar Oregim or something, a Bethlehemite, slew Goliath the Gittite whose spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. So a little bit different to Goliath of Gath but still Goliath the Gittite. And then uh, in verse 20, and there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He also was a descendant of the giants. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, brother of David, slew him. These four were descended from the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hands of David and his servants. So sometimes we think when we're warring against something and we've taken out what we believe is our Goliath, not realizing that there are others that will follow because they're from the same family and you will find that sometimes you go around that mountain a few times and you deal with this but you deal with it by the anointed you know David had that stone that was his apostolic power but the prophetic insight that he carried said that there's four more to come that's why he picked up five does this make sense so we need to increase in both our prophetic perspective and our apostolic power. As we bring the two together, then there's a victory that cannot be denied. And, and let me tell you something what the apostle apostolic brings in, which I absolutely, totally love, victory. I love victory. I love winning. I love seeing people being set free. I love the, the freedom of provision that comes. I love seeing um, people being just rested in the Lord. I love seeing that. So this is the apostolic power because it's all about victory. The prophetic is about what God is doing. This is what I see. But when you align it with the, with the apostolic, this is what I see, but this is the victory that happens. And so that's why that, it's so important that we move together. And even when uh, Moses set up the Levitical priesthood in Exodus chapter 28 under Aaron so Exodus 28 verse 1 again it's 5 from among the Israelites this is God speaking to Moses from among the Israelites take your brother Aaron and his sons with him that he may minister to me in the priest's office even Aaron and his four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So right there you have the fivefold. So every time you go through the Bible and you see the word five, look at what it's saying because it will be talking about the fivefold ministry that God has brought together into the, into the end time church. You will find that there are giants that will be raised up in families. Giants will be raised up over our communities, 
businesses. There are always um, giants fighting to dismantle businesses, kingdom businesses. This is why we need to open ourselves up to understand that we need to flow in the miraculous. That whoever you touch with your hands, the anointing of God flows out of you and just heals, delivers, sets free, whatever it might be. But I'm telling you that as, as a body of Christ, we've kind of lost sight of the miracles. We hope it's going to happen. We look for the signs and wonders. You are a walking miracle. Every time you open your mouth, you can decree a miracle. We need to see the supernatural power of God released in and upon our lives. We need to see the supernatural power released through people into situations and into circumstances. This is something that sets the difference between believers and unbelievers. You are to be a sign and a wonder. Your life is to be a sign and a wonder. And that's what when the fivefold ministry comes together and works as one, things are going to absolutely change. Because I'm telling you right now, the way the church is, open heaven or any church, we are not going to turn our world upside down. We might come to church, we might have glory times via channels, we might have an awesome time or it might just be a dry teaching time like today or whatever it might be. But we come together and, and, and you know, we have these things and that's awesome because we need that. We need to be revived and we need to enjoy God's presence. But if we don't go out there and we don't change our community, we don't change our, our, our street, our city, our nation, our state, if we don't change anything, we're just having a bless me club, we're just enjoying God's presence and we're not doing anything to transform the people who need to be transformed because Jesus came to save the world, that the world might be found safe, found safe and sound through Jesus Christ. It is about what we do with what he's given us. It is not about the fact for, and I'm telling you, sometimes we struggle because our bills aren't being paid. We struggle because there's, there's strife in the family, because we're, we're lacking this or we're lacking that. If we started to really seek the kingdom of God, that lack would disappear. And if you don't know how to seek the, 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 the kingdom of God, just ask the Holy Spirit to take over your day. Because, you know, seeking the kingdom and his righteousness sounds a bit, well, it really could be anything. It sounds pretty bored. Broad. Not bored. Broad. But if you make it seeking the king, that's seeking the kingdom, that in everything Jesus would be exalted, that in everything Jesus would be glorified, that the fame of the name of Jesus would spread throughout the land because we are alive. That Jesus would be, would, that the name of Jesus would be proclaimed over people, over situations, over everything. But Jesus must always be the chief cornerstone. The apostle and the prophet are not good or not worth any good or not able of accomplishing much unless we are connected to the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. He must be everything. He must be everything to us. We must, everything, we, you, when you open the word, you're looking at Jesus. Jesus is central to everything. Our lives must be Christ-centered. And so when we're dealing with first-generation giants over our lives, over our families, over the church, recognize that the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. And when you recognize that he is the stone, he is the stone that, that, this, that defeated Goliath, the stone that David picked up. He, as the cornerstone, he is the stone in our hand to defeat the giants that face us. Who's tired of being whipped by the giants in our lives? Right? Whether it's finances, loneliness, you know, whatever the, the bits and pieces are, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, which means that he deals with the first generation giant over our lives. But in Matthew 21, verse 42, it says that the cornerstone was rejected. It was rejected by the builders of those days. But... Because of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, his resurrection and his ascension, we have been given back again total victory. Every place the sole of your foot treads. I have always wanted to do the Joseph Business School. Always. But it's a, an, an American school. I thought I really don't need to learn about American taxes, stuff like that. But I'm looking to see what nation it is closest to because the guy who runs the Joseph Business School is Bill Winston, African-American guy. He's got one of the largest churches. 
He has the Joseph Business School and a number of other things, but he also goes out and buys shopping malls. God tells him, buy that one. And so he's got to get the money together, and usually, and by now, he doesn't believe in debt. First shopping mall, he had to buy, uh, had to borrow a little bit, but the rest of it, he's pretty good because he runs his business, his ministry, and his life according to kingdom economic principles. So God says, go and buy that shopping mall, which was run down in a ghetto area. He went and bought it. It was acres of land, 30-something acres, shopping mall, huge shopping mall, car parks, the whole thing. He bought it. And then he checked out the, the neighbourhood, uh, what they needed in the neighbourhood, what the needs were in the neighbourhood, and he made sure that every need that was in the neighbourhood was met in the shopping mall. And that shopping mall was, was fitted out and made up to be sharp, excellent, you know, great attention to detail. And it built, it, re it released a transformation into that ghetto area. And that's just the first one that he bought. So in, there's a whole area that God is wanting to bring the body of Christ into, the apostolic. One of the things that you are going to have to bind on a daily basis is the spirit of witchcraft. Add that every day. Bind the spirit of witchcraft because it is increasing in this area. And there's been a number of churches um, just lately that have I've heard have had witches that have come and visited and if you find yourself nodding off in church, it could be because I'm boring, could be because it's hot, but it also could be a spirit of witchcraft. And this is where we've got to be proactive, not passive. Proactive. Holy Spirit will show what you need to bind every day. The Holy Spirit will show you. But let's, let's get real. Let's, let's contend for the faith. So a friend of mine is um, writing a book, and I can't, I don't want to disclose too much, but writing a book, and they're wanting to expose the lies of the enemy. The publisher said wants to change the word lies because it's a bit confrontational. Can we make it misunderstanding? Satan never makes any misunderstandings. He straight out lies. So she's contending for the truth of her book. So let's contend for the faith and recognise that you are people that God has called to turn your, your world upside down, to release the glory of God, the power of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, just to release heaven on earth. This is what you're called to do. And when we come together in apostolic groups, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, and you don't have to be in a five-fold ministry to be that. Everyone on the planet has one of those in them. If you're a nurse, it's probably because you've got a pastoral heart. You know, if you're a salesman, it could be because you're evangelistic. Uh, if, you, if you love to correct people and, and make sure things are right, it could be that you're a teacher. If you hate things that are wrong and just, you see things as black and white, that's the prophetic. And if you're ready to take on a barney, you're probably apostolic. So everybody has that in them. Everybody. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we're not aware of it. Sometimes it might have been perverted because of things that have happened to us, because the devil will do anything he can to destroy the identity of Jesus Christ in a person's life. And if he can take your faith, he's got everything. But this is a new season. And God is calling us to contend. We've got cancel culture. We've got the liberal lefts. We've got kids being brainwashed in school about gender fluidity, euthanasia, all sorts of things. We can no longer sit quietly back and think, oh, well, that's just the way it goes. That is not heaven on earth.